We'll join you on this uh, Thursday afternoon, the 16th day of April, here on Radio.com. We'll be uh, hitting the fan at 6 o'clock this evening, a week to the NFL draft. Not much that new day, although we now know that it will be uh, May 15th in New York. I don't know if anybody thought once the states were clustered and the Northeast was going to act as one, you knew Jer- Jersey was having problems in trailing New York fairly dramatically even. So if New York was even thinking about the fifth, the 1st of May, and I don't know that it was, uh, but it seemed like it was going to have to wait, and now it has officially waited till May 15th. We'll see if that... I think that uh, there'll be a, some states starting as early as May 1. I think some will kick in the 15th, and I think the slow start will begin early in May. Unless something bad happens in the next two weeks, we'll see what happens with the virus going forward. And, I mean, uh, everyone that the government taps into tells them and offers them uh, about testing and leadership and stuff like that. And that's just where they just really drop the ball on this thing. Uh, And, again, they need to find a therapeutic They need to find a vaccine, which will take a while, but they could find a therapeutic. See, to me, the first game changer here is when you take death off the table. When somebody who is now when they've seen the results, even middle-aged, or has any illnesses or preconditions, the fear they've had here is, uh, and that includes me and everybody my age, it includes, even if you're in good health, which, knock on wood, I am, um, there have been too many people who have just gotten it and gotten sick and haven't been able to get ahead of this and have and have passed. I mean, they're passing at an alarming rate. Uh, so you have to take death off the table here. You have to believe before you're going to be comfortable with how you live your life, you got you have to believe that you can get this, go home, get some medicine, and get better. If you have that, you can live with it. And then eventually you get to where you get a vaccine and you don't worry about it anymore, but that's fine. That's down the road. That's stage two. The first part is getting some kind of therapeutic. I see Gilead's up today in the stock market. I didn't notice that until, and I am active in the market, but I didn't notice Gilead until they were running uh, some uh, prices late in the day here. I saw Gilead shot up like eight bucks today. Now that might mean that they their uh, their drug, their therapeutic, might be working. I know they were testing it in a bunch of places. There must be some thoughts that it's doing pretty well because I see that that number's gone up uh, dramatically, and that's that's a big move. That's a big move for. Uh, for Gilead. Um, here's the thing, though, that is so alarming. And this, to me, and this is not about politics, and I could care less about what happens in November right now. I care about what's happening today. I want to see the country get back moving. I want to see people back living their lives, and I want to see uh, the threat of people getting very sick or dying from this to go away. But Every night I get the uh, Wall Street Journal, which does a great job online. They send it to me. And they run a lot of interesting stories in it. They ran a story today that, to me, just says everything. And to me, this is what, what it's all about. And I didn't know any of this till today. It says, our research team used Food and Drug Administration guidelines and a scientific report from China to develop a COVID-19 test in early March. It took one week. Our test doesn't use the uh, regions other labs are desperately seeking. Reagents other labs use and are desperately seeking. It can identify levels of virus so low that a typical test could miss them entirely. Yet our lab sits idle. Across the United States, tens of thousands of similar academic research labs have the expertise and the equipment 
to help the country fight COVID-19 if even one-tenth of these labs joined the effort we could test an additional one million samples a day. Did you hear what I just said? If even one-tenth academic research labs conduct studies, they don't test patients. They're not allowed to test patients. In fact, they're legally precluded from offering a result that couldn't form a diagnosis. This makes sense. But in special times, you go to different plans. They, these labs sit idle right now, even though these centers and these clinical labs and these academic labs, these labs are certified. They have better diagnostic equipment. They have better trained people than the labs that are used to test people. If the CMS and the FDA would collaborate to allow states temporary, temporarily to deputize any academic research lab providing evidence of a working FDA-compliant test, several thousand idle labs across the country could validate millions of screenings. Millions. They could do, according to this story, up to 20 million tests a week. And they are better trained, better equipped to do it. They're just not licensed to do it. It's not what they do. But all they would have had to do is have those two ruling bodies, the CMS and the FDA. And this is what I'm talking about with the government. Why didn't we attack this? If we had been at war, we would have taken every possibility, every bit of manpower, every thought we could have thought of, we would have thrown into the fight. Why didn't we do that with this virus? Why didn't we use our ingenuity and use what the greatness of America? Here's a perfect example. If we had just had the FDA and the CMS make these labs... Give them the permission. They have the expertise. They were sitting idle. These labs, there's evidently in the story, there are anywhere from 30 to 40,000 of these labs in the country. And they would not work against the other labs, the, the regular clinical labs that are used for diagnostic and are in business for that. They would have worked in conjunction with them. I mean, think about that. State and federal leaders should join immediately in urging the CMS and FDA to offer swift temporary CLIA accredita accreditations for academic research labs that demonstrate the fitness to allow them to test. By clearing this path, these regulatory bodies will help all citizens have a better chance to fight, to fight the virus. And basically what they said is, hey, we have the expertise. Why not let us in the game? Why not let us get involved? I just don't understand it. They have, oh, I didn't even know all these labs existed. Why would you, if you're the government, if you're the administration, if you're the Congress, why would you not have somebody in this government bright enough to say, hey, we have all these academic labs across the country. Let's put them all to work. We could do 20 million tests a week. We could test one-third of the country inside of a month. Instead of it, we're sitting on our rear ends here doing nothing. Shameful. Absolutely shameful. Our labs exist to improve the lives and alleviate the suffering of our fellow citizens. Let us help. Where has this been? Why does the Wall Street Journal have this? And there isn't anybody who is in a leadership position in the Senate, in the Congress, in the White House, in a position to think of this. You know, we used to take the best and the brightest and throw them at our problems. We don't do that anymore. We have had a lack of leadership from the beginning on this problem. It's almost like we didn't want to take this fight on. I don't get it. I just don't get it. 
I'm not going to spend the whole day on that today. I'm going to do some draft stuff for a week away. Uh, the fan asked me to do six to seven before the draft on next Thursday and Friday, and they have draft shows both nights from seven right through the first round. So I'll do six to seven, then they'll have draft shows after that. Uh, we'll put some previews together those two nights. That's for Thursday and Friday next week. We'll do some draft preview in a minute. I saw the over-unders come out today on football. Uh, yeah, as you know, if you know me, I love the over-unders. The totals, the win totals for next year. They're out already for the NFL. And very interesting ones. And everybody rushed to see what the Bucks would be with Brady and what the Pats would be without Brady. And they met right in the middle. The Bucks are nine with Brady. The Pats are eight and a half in one with one book, nine with another book without Brady. For just the second time in 30 years, two teams are at 12. The Chiefs and the Ravens, both at 12. You have the Saints and the Niners at 10 and a half. You have the Seahawks and Cowboys and Eagles all at nine and a half. And then you have most of the league between nine, where the Bucks start, where the Bills are, where the Steelers are, down to seven. That's most of the league. And then from six and a half down, so above nine, you have the following teams. Eagles nine and a half, Cowboys nine and a half, Seahawks nine and a half. Nine is ten and a half, and who I think are an excellent over. Saints ten and a half, Ravens twelve, Chiefs twelve. I don't think the Chiefs will win 12. I think they could win the Super Bowl again, but I don't think they'll win 12. Um, and then below six, below seven, you only have these teams. Lions, six and a half. Jets, six and a half, who I think are an excellent over. Giants, five and a half. I have to see more about the defense. Dolphins at six. Panthers, five and a half. Bengals, five. Redskins, four and a half. Jacksonville, four and a half. That's it. Most of the league between seven and nine, like always. I gave you the teams above nine and a half, nine and a half or better. I gave you the teams below seven. Jets, six and a half. Giants, five and a half. As I said, a couple jumped out at me. Nine has jumped out at me as an over. I think they're a very, very good team. I think they're exceptionally strong. I think they will have a very big season. Uh... Chargers and nine, I think it's too high. That jumped out at me. Jets six and a half, I thought was too uh, low. I think the Jets will be above six and a half. Those are the ones that just jumped out at me right away. There's a couple others in the middle there. Tennessee's eight and a half, I think that's too low. I think they're better than that. So it's early, but the overrunners are always fun. As And again, Bucks. Nine with Brady, Belichick, eight and a half and one, nine and the other. Just the last 18 years in the totals, if you bet the Pats, they are 14, three and one in the last 18 years as an over bet, over the win total. 14, three and one. And to tell you the truth, a lot of times I did bet them. Uh, but they are 14, three and one in that regard. Uh, we're going to do some draft stuff. There's a lot of draft rumors. We've got a new draft guide today, at least for me. I don't know him, so we'll, I'll introduce him to you guys, and we'll uh, meet him together. A guy named uh, one of my producers hooked him up today and said, try this guy. He's pretty good. Lance Zerline's his name, uh, NFL.com. So we'll talk to him uh, when we come back. Lance Zerline joins us. Lance, Mike Francesa, welcome. How are you? Good, Mike. How you doing? Good, thank you. Where are you from? What town? Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. Okay. Uh, and how many years have you been doing a draft? Oh, I guess uh, for NFL.com, I've been doing it since 14. In general, I've been doing it since 2001. All righty. Here we go. Um, I, I saw this. I, so when I knew you were going to have you on today, I looked at a couple of things. Uh, there's a lot of talk about trades, obviously, as always, and a lot of talk about where these, uh, especially the first three quarterbacks, where they're going to go in and what order. What do you have? Now, 
you have one today where you mentioned the the Dolphins making a trade with the Bengals. You don't really think that's going is that, is that something you think is a strong no, possibility yeah, or no? Not really, no. right? No, no, no. That, and that's an older mock. I mean, that, that was. Oh, okay, that wasn't a new one. Mock. Okay, yeah. they sent me that one today. Yeah. That wasn't a new one. Okay, okay. No, no, no. That okay. was an older one. And that was one, Mike, that I did. Just so you know, I uh, I don't get caught up in the hysteria of trying to predict everything perfectly in the first couple couple of mock drafts. I try to create, you know, I try to create some contingency plans because mock because the draft doesn't go according to Hoyle in most cases, or at least not according to what the media thinks no, it's going to do. It shouldn't. No. So you got to throw, yeah, you know, you got to throw some things in there and see how the draft takes place and what shapes out after something happens. that's unexpected because that's the way it really happens. All right. We know what's going to go one, two, uh, yeah. at three, what, what do you think is going to happen? Who's going to trade? First of all, do you think the lions will trade? And if you do, who do you think winds up going up to three? Well, you know, you got to have someone you're trading for, and who do you? The question becomes, who do you trade up for? Well, I, I, I think most. I would say it's seventy-five. I, I would be surprised if somebody is trading up and not trading up for Tua. Myself, I will be very surprised if that's not the case. Yeah, and I don't think they're trading up for Tua, so that's the problem. So you think, think they're the trading line. up? You think they're trading up for her, but you don't think you're trading up for Tua? I don't think they're trading up. Oh, I you think, think the Lions the are staying at three? I think the Lions would love to move back. The problem is you got to have it takes two to tango, and I have a bad feeling for the Lions at least that they're not going to find uh, the the type of trade value that they were hoping for to move back to five or to move back to six. And I know everyone assumes they might, you know, that that Miami might jump up there or that the Chargers might jump up. But the problem is that Tua, without the ability to get to medical staffs for these teams. It's it's a little tougher for teams to buy all the way no in. No question. Not not no just question. drafting, but giving up additional draft picks to get to a, in the top three. And I don't think Herbert. I'm not sure anyone really believes that Justin Herbert is a top three type of franchise quarterback. I mean, that's. I I, I think you'll have a hard time finding anybody in the top ten that sees him that way. They may see him as a starter and potentially a good starter, but I don't think someone you trade additional picks to trade up for. So if that's going to be the case, Mike then I'm not sure that anyone's trading up for Isaiah Simmons, one of the offensive tackles, because it's deep in offensive tackle, or or even, you know, for... All right, so like you Aaron think Brown. if the Lions pick, you think they're taking the corner? I think Jeffrey Okuda is going to have to be their pick because they're just not in great shape at the cornerback spot. So I think I think they'd love to trade back and trade out of there. I'm not sure they're going to find a partner. And then so the Giants, the in your mind, do what? I think offensive tackle is what the Giants are going to need to do, and they're going to have their pick of the first tackle. So my guess is it would be Jedrick Wills or Makai Becton, based on the kind of tackles that Gettleman typically likes. I know Wurfs has all the. I like Wurfs myself, right but I, I I don't. Uh, first of all, I mean Gettleman, I don't have a great relationship. But secondly, uh, I don't uh, ever have an idea what Gettleman's going to do, um, and I do agree. You got, I, I do think they'll take a tackle under the scenario you just gave. I do. I don't know which one they'll pick. I really don't. I would prefer the Iowa one myself, I, I, and I don't know which one they will take. Uh, I do think they'll take a tackle over Simmons, though. I do agree with you on that. As to which one they'll take, I just don't know. Uh, and, and then at five, you see the Dolphins doing what? Well, see, so five, I think the Dolphins are going to have to go quarterback. Right, and so who are they taking? And and I would go Tua there. Okay. I don't know how their board stacks out, but listen, if Tua. Well, there's been a right lot of talk the last week that they like that they're afraid of Tua injury wise, which you can understand, mm-hmm. and that they're going to take Herbert there. I will be stunned if Tua is on the board after five. I will be personally myself. I will be stunned that he's that he's not off the board by then. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a second scenario. I'm gonna throw the curveball here. Miami could take a player they love, and that could be Simmons. That could be. Jedrick Wills, it could be Makai Becton because they do have a need at tackle as well. They could draft that, and because they have two picks, two additional picks in the first round, they could easily come right back up, package those two picks, and move up for the quarterback that they really like, provided that they've got a couple. You know, you got a team that needs quarterback right behind them in the Chargers. So let's just say they love Jordan Love. Let's say they really like Jordan Love. What what Miami could do is just let it play out at six, seven. Eight, and then start considering at nine or ten, flip flopping, making a move, 
and seeing if they can get up there and go get a quarterback like Jordan Love, for example. So that's a little bit of a curveball that people really haven't considered. But I think because Miami has that kind of draft capital, they can move up and down the draft a little bit and, and, and kind of go target a couple of really good players and still get a quarterback they like without having to do it at five. We're talking with Lance Erline. Uh You can get him at, at Lance Erline on Twitter. He's uh, NFL.com, NFL draft analyst. Uh, we're a week away from the draft. What team – in your mind, does Tua not get passed? Like, who's going to automatically – now, listen, I think health-wise, if he's healthy, and I, I understand, and we've been discussing this on my programs since, you know, since he got hurt, and really since he got hurt the first time, uh, his situations, and we've discussed it with orthopedic surgeons who come on with me, and they all admit – the hip's a little bit of a problem. I mean, and, you know, uh, it's something that bears watching and is in the, equa- in the equation. Uh, what team do you think he doesn't get past, which they will be absolutely flabbergasted that he's there and they will jump on him? Yeah. I would say the Raiders, the 12. Oh, he's gone yeah, way yeah. before that, though. He's gone I would way think, before but, that. But, I, Mike, I could see it going nine. Look, it's not going to be 10 with the Browns. It's not going to be you the think he gets pa- You think he gets past the Chargers? I, the furthest he could fall, if the Chargers have a problem with the hip, and let's just say that they're more interested in seeing what happens next year with their eyes toward tw- Trevor Lawrence, if you know what I mean. Well, I mean, or, yeah. If it, I mean, somebody, somebody's going to be real. I mean, I don't know who – right now your candidates I would think are going to be Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Carolina, to, and I guess Washington could be to be the three teams that will be that bad to be down there for, for uh, Lawrence next year. Well, well, well look. Carolina, Carolina is a wild card because they got Teddy Bridgewater, but can you imagine Joe Brady having a chance to work with uh, Tua? That excites me at number seven. But let's say let's say they're in on on they want to see how Teddy Bridgewater does. Let's say that were to be the case, nine would be the next logical spot for Jacksonville, and I could see Jacksonville Jacksonville being the furthest he fell. But if he starts to fall two or three teams that you expect to take him, and he falls past there. There tends to be a panic in some teams that, well, if they don't want to take them, we really can't either because maybe they have something medically that we don't because none of these teams have the information that they need. So I think the latest, and your question was, what's the latest, a team that would be flabbergasted? I'm going to go back in as far as I possibly can, and I think it's the Raiders at 12 because if you have a chance to add two, and I don't care about Marcus Mariota, they could get rid of Carr easily and let you know Tua sit for a year and let him compete the very next year if they wanted to. But I think that's the absolute furthest he would fall. And if Tua fell there to twelve, I mean, I'd race the card up if I'm if I'm. Well, the, there's uh, been the some. You, you're funny. You bring him up because there's been some rumors the last couple of days that Gruden, who does have a lot of power, uh, could blow this entire draft up for the quarterback he loves. Now, yeah. I, I don't know if he covets two. I don't know that. I don't know what quarterback he loves. And with him, you never know who he loves because he's a little goofy. So, I mean, he could be in love with anybody. Uh, but if he loves someone and he's willing to blow the draft up, I just don't know if he has enough ammo to blow the draft up in the top five. Yeah, and, and that's why I think a lot of people are going to wait. I, I, I don't think they're going to buy into the panic and hysteria. I think when teams trade up are going to be when they think they see value. And, and they're going to see value if a player slides below a certain – no one's coming up to three. But if Tua falls past number five, for example, the Dolphins, then all of a sudden people might dig in with the Chargers and say, hey, what's going on with your thoughts on quarterback? Do you think or, the Chargers I, definitely take a quarterback? Well, once again, if you don't believe in a quarterback, why would you? When you know you have Trevor Lawrence and Josh Fields potentially coming But remember, you're year. only going to get Lawrence if you're the worst team in the league. No, I know. You get one shot at that. But Josh Field is looking like a pretty good Yeah, but the other guys can't offense. miss. I mean, the other guy's going to have a grade. He's going to have a grade like Luck. Right. Like, he's going to have an Aikman grade. Correct. He's going to have an Elway grade. He's going to have a Luck grade. He's going to have a can't miss Hall of Fame grade. Well, but the problem and the problem you have with the Chargers, I don't think the, I think the Chargers are good enough defensively. That even yeah, they're not going to be that bad. They, 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 yeah, they can't be that. They, they can't ta- – I don't think there's that many teams – now, listen, somebody could get an injury, but I don't think there's that yeah. many teams that could be that bad. I mean, I think 
the Dolphins, the well, Panthers, ask- uh, the Bengals right. could, but they could be breaking in a new quarterback and be that bad. But that's okay. But, I mean, that happens. But uh, yeah, the th- Bengals wouldn't take. No, they wouldn't take them. Right. Question, though, yeah. Mike. Let me ask you this yeah. question. You've got all this. You've got all this COVID going, and, and what if they don't have their their stadium built? What if you don't now? You 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 don't have your quarterback you've had since two thousand four. You are going to have a team that uh, is, is every game was already a road game for them as it as it was. Denver, I think, is going to be better. I think the Raiders are going to be better. I think the Chiefs are good. I think it's there's a really good possibility that you're looking at the worst team in the in the, in the division. Well, you got a team though that if you look at the over unders that came out today, they're eight and a half. I mean, they are not a bad yeah, team. Lot. They're in the middle of the league. I don't. I think they. I think that's too high for them. But still, they are. They do have decent personnel on that team. They do have some players on that team. They do. They they do. They do. Most of it, I think, is I think the defense makes. Look, I don't think they're one of the three worst teams next year. No, I really no. I honestly no nor do I. But you also don't, and you know this, Mike. Brian Billick once told me this: as soon as you draft a quarterback in the first round, the clock is ticking on your job. So if you're going to draft a guy like Justin Herbert, for example, or Jordan Love. The clock's ticking on your job as, as soon as you draft him, and you better you better really like that guy, or it, it's no different than drafting. Well, how about love? You know, a lot of people have love all over the round. Where do you have love? I mean, I would I can tell you this. To me, love is a second rounder. Okay. I didn't like the tape at all last year. I know there was extenuating circumstances with all the change, but he didn't play well, and he's owned it in the postseason that he didn't play well. He doesn't make excuses. Um, but I just he is too volatile for me to go all in on love back into the first that'd be fine if i had a plan for him and i got a quarterback in front of him that's fine but i do not want to throw him to the wolves right off the bat because he didn't handle that kind of situation last year with a bunch of turnover he didn't handle that well at all all right it's just not impressive lance Zerline, uh draft guy for nfl.com give me the, the we mentioned the tackles and we know it's a deep draft for offensive tackles mm-hmm. the best tackle in your mind is which one jedrick wills and it's not that close alabama and why? why? I mean, what, why him over the others? Because, I mean, a lot of people yeah. like other guys. Why that guy? Sure, sure. I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, and, and I can comp him against any of these other three tackles. Number one, he's got better uh, power, drive-blocking power than, than Tristan Worse. He is much more technically sound with more consistent footwork than both Andrew Thomas and Makai Becton. He is well-coached at Alabama. I think from a technique standpoint, He's a little better than, than people probably realize. And he's the only guy, to me, out of these quote-unquote big four tackles that is a plus run blocker and plus in pass protection. He played on the right side at Alabama because Tua was left-handed, but coaches at Alabama believe that he can play on the left side in the NFL. And he has potential guard uh, uh, talent. Look, What do you think, is be- you think he's a left tackle is what you think he is? I, I, I give him a shot there, yeah. If okay. you have a need at left tackle, I'd absolutely give him a shot there. If not, you know he's a really good right tackle. All right. But now, I think he's athletic enough. And the, and the run, and there's a lot of wide receivers. Which one of the wide and – and especially the big three, they're all different. Right. Which one of the wide receivers you like the best? Small, small lean to uh, to C.D. Lamb, but I've got Jerry Judy right there with him. But I don't think any, I don't think any of these wide receivers are big-time guys. I think – Judy, Ruggs, and Lamb have a chance to be good wide receivers. I don't think they have a chance to be dudes, not by NFL standards. I think they're going to be good. I don't think anyone's going to so be So there's fun. no Julio Jones in the group, you mean? No. no. Okay. Uh, so you think, and the best one in your mind is Lamb? Small lean to Lamb, but I'm not all the way in on him. I think he's like the 11th or 12th best player in the track. Any chance the Redskins don't take Young at two? No chance. You're trading out of Julius Peppers if you do that, and I don't think anyone's doing that. Um, any chance? Uh, no, we know the Bengals are taking. The, we know they're already taking yep. him, so we know that. So two, and then at three, any chance the Lions take somebody but the corner? Yeah, I think there is a chance. I think they could take tackle, and I think they could take um, Isaiah Simmons. So I think there is a chance that they could shake up the draft. I think Mike. The real question here, the interesting question, is any chance that the Patriots do something uh, unexpected in the first round to go get a quarterback. I that, doubt it. I da- you I know don't they, do- so. they don't they don't, they don't believe in that. You know their whole right. thing is built on having picks in the 28 
to 40 to 60 area because they think they're the best value in the draft uh, and the best bang for the buck. They don't like to overpay for players. So I, I doubt that very much. I'd be, it's, very, I it's very against their, their religion to do that. Yeah, no, no. And the fact that they don't have draft capital to do it this year makes it even less likely. And I think that's – I get asked it all the time, but look, if they had two seconds this year – then maybe they would think about moving up. They have zero seconds. Yeah, and and, that's, and you know, and they love and they love being in a certain range in the draft. They love players where they think they're getting a good bang for their buck. I mean, that's always how they they hate paying people. You know that. So, uh, and listen, they have the defense to be an eight win team. Special teams defense, as long as they find a kicker, they have eight wins there with his coaching. The question is, what do they get out of the quarterback? Right, yeah, that's going to be the question. And you know what, the only way you know is if you play him and you let him go through an entire season and you see how he handles success or adversity or whatever comes his way. It's not, you know, you don't know what you have until you actually play the game. All right, who's the sleeper player? I mean, who's a player in the first round that you think is going to be picked earlier than anybody thinks? Um, I would say... That player is going to be Jalen Rager, TCU wide receiver. All right. All right. So, and how about um, who's the player that sinks like a stone? Oh, I think that will be, uh, well, I'll give you two. I think Terrell Lewis out of Alabama, the edge will fall for some uh, injury issues. And then I think uh, A.J. Epinesa, who had some heat as a mid-round first-rounder, uh, earlier on in the process, I think he falls out of the first round. And you have three quarterbacks going uh, early, not, and you don't have Love going early, right? You have the three quarterbacks going early, but not Love. I think Love is the one. I, I don't know, Mike. To be honest with you, I don't know where to slot Love because he's the hardest guy to slot. I think he goes in the first, um, but I think Love is going to be the surprise pick, or where he will either be a surprise pick at like number five out of nowhere to to Miami, or he will be a draft pick from a team that we don't expect to take him. You know, where you, where you have a team say, you know what, let's take him, stash him, and develop him. And, and somebody's going to say, whoa, I didn't expect them to, to grab uh, Jordan Love. And, you know, and the Raiders could be a team that, you know, that, that buy into him as well. That The Raiders, to me, even though they have two quarterbacks right there, I still think they're a team that, that you have to take keep an eye on for quarterback. And you mentioned the rumors recently about them. Yeah, well, there's always rumors about Gruden because he's goofy. You know that. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. We're talking <laughs> with Lance Zerline, does the NFL draft uh, for NFL.com. Uh, two things, local teams. Number one, the Giants' most likely pick is? I'd say uh, I'm going to go Mekhi Becton from, LS, uh, from Louisville, the big – nimble left real back. big he's real big yeah, he's real big and you know he's as big as trent brown basically but he moves great trent brown doesn't move great this kid really moves exceptionally well he's got a lot of talent you know what scares me a little bit is uh, and look eric flowers didn't move like this oh, but he eric was flowers terrible. was a sloppy technique guy yeah. and it didn't get corrected and there are some issues i'm still shocked he's wise. in the league i know he's found a home now but i'm yeah. shocked he's in the league to be honest i with thought you. he should have been a guard Look, my well, listen, he's turned out to be a guard now, and he found a home at guard, so you're right. Yeah. I mean, they, they played him at left, he flunked. They played him at right, he flunked. And then they got rid of him, and he, now he's playing as a guard. Yeah, he should have been a guard from the outset. There's certain things you just can't get. All right, and what do the Jets do with 11? I think the Jets will go uh, offensive line. They'll go offensive tackle if one is available, and if one's not there, they'll go wide receiver. It's either tackle or receiver with the Jets. Right, and I mean, so if if there's only if it, if any one of the four tackles is there, do they take them, or does one have to be there for them to take them, or do they well, move to one? What or does what or does it move <laughs> if one's not there? If if a certain yeah. guy's not there, does that move them to wide receiver? No, I think one. If any of the four are there, they take them. Any I, of the four is there, and if all the wide the receivers are there, who do you think they take? Oh, that's a tough one, Mike. I would say, I would say C.D. Lamb. Okay. Because he's a bigger target, he can play inside and outside. So I'd say C.D. Lamb fits them better with Adam Gase, and then. But if, I don't care who the tackle is. If they can get a tackle, they got to get a tackle. If I tell you that one of the uh, wide receivers was a seven-time uh, Pro Bowler in his first nine years, which one of them do you think it was? Well, I'd say you were talking about it next year with Jamar Chase at LSU. No, I mean this year's guys of the, of this year's wide receivers. 
Honestly, I would say the one guy that would have a chance to me would be Ruggs. And I'll tell you why. Electric speed. Um, he's very tough underneath. And I've seen what Tyreek Hill could do with electric speed. So, uh, to me, if he got with the right system, I would say a guy who runs in the four twos, that would be the guy who has the best chance to hit, you know, pro bowl, all pro, whatever you said in that many years, he would, he would be the guy. He, he didn't, I think he's got a lower floor, but when you run in a four twos, you've got a tremendous uh, potential ceiling if you can get in the right system. And how much heat is Bill O'Brien taking right now? Oh my gosh. It's, I've never seen anybody. Look, I've been doing sports radio in Houston since 1997. I've been a lifelong fan of Houston sports. I have never seen anybody, and this and this goes back to Bud Adams, who had the Oilers. I'm not sure that I've seen someone more disliked in Houston uh, than Bill O'Brien. The, the fans here just are at their wit's end because he's consolidated all the power. He's not the most likable guy. And right now I think everyone feels like they're being held hostage because they can't – like there is – he, he controls the whole team. And well, you know, I some guys like to – you know, some guys, you know, you got to watch when you come from a certain background and you want to yep. do an impersonation of somebody, you better make sure you know how to do it. I mean, uh-huh. it's like Charlie Weiss tried to do a Parcells impersonation, didn't work. Uh, if Bill O'Brien tries to do a Belichick impersonation – it's probably not going to work, and you know that's no, what, it never does. and that's what he's trying to do right now. He's trying to he's trying to pull a Belichick impersonation. You know, maybe I, I just think he's a red ass. Look, I think he's uh, I think he's a Massachusetts red ass guy, which is fine. I don't mind that. But what I do mind is when you let your personality and your conflicts get get in the way of relationships with guys. Well, if it makes you, know, you make bad trades, then you're in trouble. Exactly. I mean, you can't make – listen, you can get rid of a guy, but you can't make a bad trade with a guy. You can – see, you. I always think that way. If you're in charge and you're the head coach, you can make a trade. I don't have a problem with you making a trade. If you can't coach the guy and you're the coach, that's fine. But you can't make a bad trade. No – what did you, Mike? What did the Giants get for for Odell Beckham? Not enough. Not enough. But they got no, they got a lot sort of more. Part. But they got a lot more than he got for a player who's probably better. A lot more. Yeah. A lot more. Yeah. And and that, and that's the thing is the Texans did not get enough. And and look, if you have to trade, you got to trade. But you got to know what you're doing. And my biggest problem is Bill O'Brien, the coach. He's fine. I don't. You know, he's okay. Bill O'Brien, the general manager, has no idea about value. And look. Just because you're a head coach doesn't mean you understand the mechanisms of trade, of value, of salary cap, of team building. And he's building for 2020. All he cares about is exactly what it's in his, what's in his face. And that's the reason you never let those guys be general managers, because you're not supposed to do that. See, Bill O'Brien is a guy who is not a bad coach or a good coach. I mean, he, he has had some awful big games, including last year, where he was hideous. But the thing is, his claim to fame was one good idea. He came up with a two-tight end system that revolutionized the league, which he came up with. Give him credit for it. He came up with it. He developed it. It worked because they had two great tight ends who could implement it and a great quarterback. And he's lived off that for a very, very long time. And you know what? He's run out of time. Yeah, well, you know, and he's been drafting tight ends left and right, so I guess that makes some sense. That's what he's looking for, but he hasn't been able to find that person. Well, yeah, because you know, he had two that was special. I mean, I know one was right. a crazy, uh, you know, one, one was goofy and the other one was really crazy. So, I mean, but they both could really play, and obviously they invented a heck of a system. But uh, th- what he's done down there hasn't made a whole lot of sense. And, and I've never thought he's a very good ga- uh, big game coach anyway. I think he's made his, – his coaching last year was atrocious in that game absolutely atrocious i mean just, yeah i was I, I think your read on that one is accurate uh, although i do think he's better at making in-game adjustments than, than gary kubiak was i think gary kubiak in terms of a houston coach was better at putting together game plans and things like that but if if you had like the giants would always ruin gary kubiak's outside zone scheme they always use their bare front and would ruin his outside zone and he didn't respond well bill o'brien is a little bit better at responding on the fly but i'm telling you his personality is becoming an issue um, here, and I think we're seeing it now with his inability to get along with certain players. So 
Um, it really bears watching how he deals with Deshaun Watson. Or maybe more. And they had time. a lot of see. They had a lot of talent on that team. A lot of big game play. A lot of big yeah. premium talent, game breaking players on that team. And they're hard to collect. And they had a bunch of them. And they they're losing them right and left. JJ has played thirty two games the last four years. I mean, I'm sorry, he's missed thirty two games. Yeah, the last and four you got years. him, and obviously Clowney's gone, and you know, and and obviously now you know you lose your wide receiver, he's gone, and you know they all of a sudden a lot of those guys are gone. Yep, and Laramie Tunsil is not signed to a contract yet, and Deshaun Watson may not very happy camper so oh yeah i'm it, sure he it, won't be uh, absolutely not good in houston right now all it's right well good. listen thanks for coming on appreciate it enjoy the draft uh, let me ask you one other thing uh, real quick yeah, yeah. um for the you what's going to be the ha- the thing that it's going to be a very different draft it's going to be a very different run draft what's the thing that you're going to be more interested in about how different this draft's going to be uh, I think for me, it's going to be how do, how do teams draft players that they didn't get 40 times on, like Grant Delpit from LSU, uh, Trevon Diggs from Alabama. If you don't know what a, te- what a guy runs in the 40, Laquan Treadwell was a guy that you know fooled some teams, I think, uh, when, he was, when he was drafted by Minnesota. It was a big flop. I think the guys who didn't get a run at the Combine and, and maybe guys who have leftover medicals that, that weren't able to get checked out during the pro day, you know, during the, uh, the, uh, the 30 day visits, where they get drafted and how they're slotted. I think that's, what's most interesting to me. And obviously two is the headliner out of that group. Plus they, you know, if you got any bad actors, nobody knows what they've been doing for two months. Which is, no, I mean, which is, has got to scare a lot of people. So if you got a red flagged guy, you're not going to go near him now because you haven't been able to put anything on him. You haven't been able to put eyes on him for two months. Yeah, you're right. No, that's a good point, and uh, that's a big concern for teams th- this year. Any any flags, any red flags at all, are being dealt with much. I think much more harshly this year. I would agree. Thanks very much, Lance. Uh, good right. luck. Thank you. All right, Lance Erline, back after this. As we do on this uh, April the 16th, chilly, not not very warm. I tell you, more and more, you know that, uh, and you learn it every baseball season, but you know that the weather is just is just not good. It is just not good here in April. I mean, until you get to May, you just can't count on the weather in the Northeast. It's, it's, it's better in the late October. And late October weather can be beautiful and it can be warm. It can be warm in the November here. So you're better on that end of the calendar than you are on the early part of the calendar where the weather just is not good in April. It's just not warm in April right now. Today was cold. I mean, today was – I mean, they're talking about uh, freezing temperatures. It's going down in the 30s tonight. You know, uh, tomorrow's going to be 50 degrees. Saturday's going to be 50 degrees tops and rain. I mean, I, I don't see a 70-degree day in the next 10 days on the, uh, on, on the list of days. I mean, that's terrible as we get into the 20th, 25th day of, uh, of the month. You know, I've been trying to um, – I've been thinking about opening up the, the swimming pool early because, hey, we're here. You know, everyone's in the house. Everyone's stuck. So, you know, open it up. You know, can't they, they've closed the golf course now. You can't even go, you know, take a couple of clubs and fool around a little bit. They've closed it completely now. So you can't even do that right now. Uh, so uh, I've talked about doing that. But, you know, it's just – it's heated, but it's still it's a little chilly for this time of year to start going out to the pool. May, maybe. We'll see. Uh, but, you know, uh, we've got another month to go minimum. I think – you hope that they'll, I think, will be heading in that direction. The one thing is you don't want to open and then have to close again because that, be, that would be so earth-shattering. I mean, that would be so devastating mentally and, and on the collective psyche of, the, uh, of, of everybody. And you see now, and it's not good for anybody, but you see now these protests about opening up states. You know, I want, to, I want you to open a state up, so I'm going to protest. Think about it. People are dying at a rate of a couple of thousand a night. Still dying at a couple of thousand a night. 600 died last night in New York. Every night you look at the number nationally, it goes up 1,500, 2,000 people every night. And people like that, that's not happening when they start when they start, you know, saying, hey, let's go, let's get, you know, you act like, people act like 
shutting the, you know, shutting the country down, which I understand was not an optimum thing to do. Nobody wanted to see the economy slow down like this. But what was the alternative to have people, you know, as it was, you had bodies in places like Elmhurst, Queens, just like stacked up. What would have happened if they didn't have some people staying at home, have people sheltering and have them keeping their distance, which I think they did, except in the case of uh, a couple of, you know, lunkhead players, I think they've done fairly well. I don't know anybody who hasn't done it. Um, because you've been leery about what's going on because we've all known people already who have gotten the virus and died. I mean, I don't think anybody doesn't know somebody who's gotten it or been very sick or had, or had real complications from it. But I, I'm surprised by the reaction. Hey, you act like somebody's doing it to bother you. They're trying to get this right. The one thing that just drives you crazy, though, is how did they think that testing wasn't going to be part of this? Now, it can't be the only thing. And let's be honest, there's some things that as we restart the economy, as some people go back to work, and not everybody's going to go back to work, you're going to see a lot of people have their meetings still by Zoom or by uh, Microsoft team or by Slack or by whatever operation. I saw Slack, which is a company I, you know, which has, uh, I touted the service. I touted Zoom and Slack. Zoom has done much better. Um, but I touted Slack early on and they opened a different way. I'm not going to get into all the technical stuff. And the stock was hot early and then it dropped down and it really, it, it's, it hasn't done well. It's gone. It's it got the forty the first day, and then went down to like fifteen, and now it closed today like twenty nine, and they're doing much better now, as a, you know, as a uh, way of connecting. Uh, even saying today, how Slack found the growth has been incredible. Uh, Working from their kitchens, living rooms during the virus continues to be a major tailwind for the, the communication service Slack, which is the WR work. WRK is the symbol. Uh, it's not like anything we've seen in the past, said the founder. He said it's really cutting across all segments. Customers expanding their usage, uh, increasing their daily use of it, more messages, more time spent online, brand new customers, new teams organizing. Uh, everywhere, every day. Uh, he said it's been eye-popping. He said it's been crazy how busy they've been. So, I mean, these, I don't think these things are going to go away, whether it's Zoom, Slack, uh, Microsoft Team, uh, Google Meeting, whatever. I'm sure there's other ones I don't even know about. Um, but these work, and I think, There'll be that. I don't see people rushing out to the movies. Would you go to the movies? Why? You can watch every movie at home. Why would you go to the movies? You can, if you have three or four different services, if you have Netflix, you get plenty of movies. If you get any of the other services, you can purchase movies that are first-run movies. You can buy them a week out. The thing is, if you want a movie that's hot, they'll charge you 15 bucks for it. If you want a movie that's been out for two months, they'll charge you three bucks for it, or five ninety eight for it, or three ninety eight for it. You know, within a, if it's been out a month, they'll charge you three ninety eight for it. So you know, it costs you fifteen bucks to go to the movies before you even buy the popcorn, and now you can buy the movie for three bucks. So why would you go to the movies? So that's out, and it's obviously helped services like Netflix and uh, Roku. And and really all of them. Disney's done well, although they're obviously getting hurt with their uh, amusement parks. Um, but their ter service is doing well. Netflix has been flying 
like Amazon's been. You see, Amazon's always been a great company, though. I mean, now Amazon's, Amazon's always been my number one holding. It always has been forever. Amazon, Apple have been my number one, number two forever. So that's and now Amazon had done nothing for a long time, and now it's gone crazy in the last two weeks. Just crazy. Um, you see the Amazon truck out in the street every day. So, but I don't see people going back to games until you know that you're confident you're not going to get this if you haven't had it. If you're 30 years old, I don't think you're worried about it. If you have a, uh, any kind of illness or any kind of condition, you're worried about it. And if you're 60 years old, you're worried about it. You are, because you don't want to deal with it. Why would you toy with it? Especially when you've seen people, you, you know, get sick. So once we know, once we know that death's off the table, where you're not dealing with that kind of outcome anymore, I think then people will go to games. Until then, I don't see people going to games. I don't know if the, how they're going to handle restaurants. I mean, I, I could see them get takeout. I don't know about sitting in a crowded restaurant. And good restaurants are always crowded. I don't know about uh, Broadway plays. I feel for those people. What about those performers? What about concerts? What about Live Nation? Live Nation's a great company. How do they come back? Who's going to go to a concert right now? I think those companies aren't going to be thriving until they have a vaccine. I think sports is not coming back in a live way, come back on TV way, but I don't think it's coming back as far as a, a live event where people are in the arenas and in the stadiums until there is a way that we know that you're safe. So there's going to be a game-changing vaccine or a game-changing therapeutic before any of that happens. That goes without saying. Nobody's going to go out there and get the virus on purpose. And they're going to they're going to be careful. They're going to stay away from crowded subways. They're going to stay away from crowded offices. They're going to stay away from crowded bars and restaurants. They're not going to go to the movies. They're not going to go to sporting events. That's going to change until we get the drugs. Now, like I said, I saw Gilead jump up today. I'll have to see why they did. They have that remsidivir, uh, which is a drug they used for uh, arthritis. I know they were giving that to people at certain, they were doing clinical studies with it. Maybe that's rung the bell. If it did, great. I mean, that would be a game. I mean, we'd be thrilled if that was the case. That's the good news we need. But I think we'd all have heard that if that were the news. If somebody rung, it really rang the bell. Because when somebody rings the bell and, that, and we know that they have it, they're going to make a lot of noise. And rightfully so. Because that's a game changer. You know, we ask these, you know, everyone always gets on the drug companies until you need them. Then you ask them to save people's lives. And right now you're asking them to save, you're asking them to go into the laboratory and use their expertise and use their genius to save lives. When we come back, we'll be on the fan. He's ready to go on the fan. New York Sports Radio. Mike's on, Mike's on. He'll get you the sports any way that he can. It's Mike Francis on. a little after six on this april the 16th for this thursday night uh take you to the bottom of the hour where you'll hear as i just heard them say uh, 1986 game six so uh with howie rose taking you through it so one of the classics uh this is one if you haven't you can sit back and have a little fun with that go down memory lane uh with all the drama all the ups and downs and craziness of uh 1986 World Series Game 6. Brought to you by Casamigos Tequila. As always, brought to you by those who drink it on this uh, Thursday evening, a chilly day here in New York. And again, uh, we learned today from the governor that uh, we will at least wait until the 15th day of May before we start, start to do anything of any uh, major movement in our state. So we are still a month away. 
uh, and uh, we've been really officially in place since I believe the 22nd was the first official day of March. So it has been almost a full month uh, that we have been uh, already in place, and now it will be another uh, another full month before we get to move uh, about and begin what will be the gradual, and it will be, it will be gradual. Like we, as I said, as we were talking about it on on radio.com before I came on the fan, it will be gradual. It's not going to be everything at once. It's not like all of a sudden, boom, hey, you know what, we're going to a party tonight, and there's a concert tonight, and there's a celebration tonight, and there's 65,000 people here and 50,000 here, 20,000 here, and jammed, uh, you know, arenas here. Uh, it's not going to be that way. It's going to be very, very painstakingly slow as to what is acceptable and what isn't, what uh, people are comfortable with and what they're not. And again, as we know, the uh, the therapeutics and the discoveries made and what we learned from the clinical trials and everything else will play a very, very big role. Uh, you just heard a second player uh, in the NFL testing positive today, and this one, a prominent one, is Von Miller. It was announced through his agent has tested positive. And again, hey, that doesn't mean anything because it's Von Miller. He is in a uh, age bracket where he should be fine. It would be extraordinary. It would be very rare if he would be in danger in that age bracket. Most people are not. But still, when it happens to an athlete right now, when it happens to a prominent player now, it is news. When it happens to anybody prominent, it is news. Uh, and it just shows you that it uh, knows no boundaries. And it can happen in any state. You can have an outburst anywhere. Uh, all you need is someone to travel. And, you know, one makes two, and two makes four, and et cetera, et cetera, and away you go. So uh, we do know that that's the case. We don't even know how it's going to react to the heat as we warm up, but we're still a ways away from warming up. I mean, we're talking about how it's going to react when we're in the 80s and we're in the 90s. But I could tell you this, they have uh, plenty of it in Florida, and the temperatures there are very warm. And have been warm. I have friends down there. I have people staying at my house down there. They've been in the high 80s and 90s. And everything's closed down there. And they have they have had temperatures as high as Monday's supposed to be 94 degrees. So they have had it be very warm there. And if you thought that that would just automatically kill it off, well, not the case because they have plenty of it, and there's plenty of other areas that have plenty of it where they've had heat. So it's not the case. Now, it might not live as well, and it might not be uh, able, it might not be as contagious, it might not transfer as well in that kind of heat, especially it evidently doesn't in a lot of dry heat, which you don't usually get in Florida this time of year. You get more of a, a, a damp heat at times. But the real dry heat of the West is where they think it may not do that well. But again, we have to wait and see how that unfolds in places like Vegas and Arizona and everything like that. So, again, we, won't, we just won't know. We just won't know. Uh, so here we are on the Thursday. Uh, again, looking at a month, looking at more questions than answers, which has made this the toughest part, is that unlike other things we've been through, we have something happen, we start a recovery, we roll up our sleeves, we're given direction, we get behind leadership, and away we go. Here, there has been nothing but uncertainty. And still, as we've been in place for a month, looking at another month, we don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know for how long, and we don't even know the quality of it when we start back. 
So all we have is a state of anxious, complete anxiety, and complete uncertainty. And those are very, very hard to digest. The anxiety isn't easy, and the uncertainty is very hard. And there's not there's nothing concrete about it. It's let's see how it does. There had been rumblings. I could tell you behind the scenes that it was going to be maybe five five one instead of five fifteen, and then some of the numbers weren't great in certain areas especially New Jersey, from what I understand. And remember, there has to be a connection. You can't separate New York from New Jersey because, hey, people come back and forth between the two states every minute. You can't act like it's, 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 you can't act like it's not one place. It is one place. That's why to do it in the region the way they have out west and the way they have here makes plenty of sense because, let's be honest, this is, in many cases, one big state. Because there's free movement between the states every minute. I mean, people go back and forth from state to state, and you know, sometimes three and four times in a day. So there's no declaration there. There's no divide, you know, division line there that is, you know, something that is concrete or or permanent in any way. So that's why there has to be a continuity and a unison, and that wasn't there. So right now. We're looking at the 15th. We're waiting to hear more. Still, there's a whole bunch of people dying, and there's a whole lot of questions to answer, and we don't have a whole lot either. Back after this. What is going on? we got people dying, uh, 600, 700 a clip, 1,000 in the metropolitan area, and he's taking bows. I mean, what, what, this thing's not over. You know, I understand, you know, he figures, hey, if I just say it's over, I'll declare victory and just move on. Hey, we didn't lose as many people as we thought. Who said? Who ever decided how many people we're going to lose? We lost way too many as it is, number one. Number two, we have done a terrible job. It's been the, it's been the Keystone Cops from the beginning. We still don't test anybody. We still don't even have a plan how to get out of this, and now we're declaring victory. I mean, listen, if you can get away with it, you might as well try because it's got nothing to lose. Because if you examine what's been done here, it's been a complete mess. So if you might as well just say, hey, I did a great job, and then let people punch the holes in it and say, oh, they don't like me. Well, that's fine, you know. Let's be honest. I don't care where you come down on this politically, one way or the other, because it shouldn't be about elections or politics right now. It should be about the calamity we're all in, and we're all still in the middle of it. Nothing has changed. We still don't know when we're getting out of it. We have no date. All we know is we're here in New York till May 15th. People are still dying at a very, now, fewer people are going into the hospital. I give you that. And that's what we got for being here since the 22nd of March. But people are still dying at a rate of 600 or more a night in New York State and are dying at over 1,000 to 1,500 a night in America. We have food lines. We haven't gotten to the depth of how bad the economy is going to be, and we don't know how we're going to put this economy back together in the next months or maybe even more than months. Some people are thinking that we could be like this until September, October. So I'm not talking about being home, but being in a position where we we have very little movement and very little freedom and are walking around in masks. Walking around in masks and not being able to go to a ball game, and not being able to go to the movies, and not being able to go to a restaurant, and not being able to go within six feet of somebody is not exactly a victory. But remember, this is, what this is, is really like an infomercial to try and get reelected. That's all, that's, that, that's basically it. You have to judge it as that, because that's what it is. It's an infomercial, because it has nothing to do with what's, what you're dealing with or what I'm dealing with has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is an infomercial to try and get reelected and try and spin heads. That's it. So you don't get any news out of it. There's nothing you learn from this stuff at all anymore. Nothing. There's nothing. There's not one thing you're going to learn from this. You're going to reopen the country in three phases. There's counties that don't have it. Yeah, the counties that don't have it have no people and they have no economy. 
you have hotspots in about 70-something percent of the viable economy in the country. Near the big cities is where you have hotspots, where you have people dying, where you have a lot of virus, uh, especially our area, where we still have a vast amount of virus. In the New Jersey, where they're still very worried about things. In the other parts of the country, where we're sending ventilators to other people now. So if you can get up there and tell me you have a drug that works and it's been clinically proven and the doctors say you can take it, that's a victory. Tell me that you got a vaccine that you're ready to go forward with, that's a victory. Then you can declare right now. But to declare like we've worked well together and now we move to the next phase and everything's great, everything's not great. We haven't learned one thing. We don't know anything. Give me one declarative thing you know that you can do next week. Tell me when a sport's coming back. Tell me when anything that is in your life. Tell me if your kids are going to camp this summer. Tell me the next time your kids are going to high school, college, or grammar school. Tell me the next time you can go to your church or synagogue. Tell me the next time you can go to your supermarket and just shop or go to the mall you can't tell me anything about any of that. You can't tell me where you can get a test. You can't tell me where you can get an antibody test. You can't tell me anything right now. You cannot give me a declarative statement about anything I've mentioned. And this is a month in to what we're doing. And now you've just been told by the governor you're looking at another month. Not that it was terrific and you're going to start moving May 1st. No, May 15th before we consider. And he didn't say May 15th to target date. He just said you're in place till May 15th. He's not opening anything anyway because he has no power to open anything. We all know that. Okay. Everyone understands that the states have the power. We all know that. So all he can do is say, here's what I... It's all a show. It's, it's a show basically to try and tell you that he didn't botch the thing up. That's basically it. That's what, that's what it is. It's an infomercial. And you don't learn anything from it anymore. You've got to be honest. There's not anything. You know, there are no real guidelines for reopening or anything. They're going to open counties in areas where there's no people. L.A. is not opening. California is not opening. New Jersey, the, the, the Northeast is not opening. Nowhere we are. And you know, you know how many people live in the Northeast? We're not opening. We are in place for another month. And do you know what our economy is going to look like in a month? The only thing they did, and we'll pay for it later with wild inflation, and our kids will pay for it down the road, because now the deficits that we run up don't matter anymore. They used to matter, but they don't matter anymore. Okay, but our kids are going to pay for those. And we're going to pay with inflation because the Fed, which I didn't know that, I don't know, and you'd have to have some people who study uh, on a very high level uh, the economy to tell me what the Fed should have done and shouldn't. But the Fed, as you know, backstopped everything and produced an incredible amount of liquidity, which has made the stock market viable and which has really kept the markets very quiet and very peaceful and actually somewhat prosperous. But the unemployment numbers are staggering. The economic indicating numbers are staggering. They will be so much more staggering in April, and there's a lot of hardship coming, and the message they're starting to send now is like, oh, wow, yeah, this is great. We're out of this. And they talk of expanded testing. Don't give you anything about that. That's up to the states. We're punting on that. How they handle ten testing will be recognized. I promise you this. And I voted for this president. How they mishandle testing will be considered one of the big mistakes and will never be handled this way again in confronting a pandemic in the history of America because it's been that crazy, and it's been that badly handled. Now, nobody 
had a game plan for this. Nobody did. And I understand gamesmanship and running for re-election and understand all that. That's the political game. But when you try to spin things when people are still dying, it's offensive. If they're not dying anymore, I can understand you starting to say, I got to spin things because I got to worry about getting reelected. When people are still dying and we don't have any answers, it's not, it, it, it's not the way you play it. First fix the problem before you start spinning it. And someone this morning said, all it is now is an infomercial, and they're right. It's an infomercial. That's all it is. Because there's no information. And it's just, don't blame me. And yeah, we'll get it done. And yeah, we're going to expand testing. How? There's no details. And we're going to open where? We're here in the most populated area of the country, the most densely populated area of the country. We live in the most densely populated area of the country, and we are shut down for another month. And there's going to be a lot of businesses that we all deal with that are run by friends of ours, that are owned by friends of ours, that are owned by family members of ours, that are owned by people we know who are all going to face incredible hardship over the next month. Because the worst has not been felt yet. The idea that we aren't going to pay a price for what we've done to this economy, we're going to pay a, a huge price. And we just have to understand we're going to pay it. We had no choice. I'm not saying we did. I'm not saying there was another alternative, but to act like it's over when we are basically right in the middle of it is just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. You can't take bows when people are still dying in enormous numbers like they are. Enormous numbers. And where we just got told today, hey, we're not going anywhere for another month. There are a lot of people who didn't want to hear that. There are a lot of people who need to get back to work who don't think their business is going to be here in another month. They don't know if their job will be there in a month. They don't know if they have enough food or enough money to get through another month or if they can meet the mortgage or meet their expenses. And there's not anywhere for them to go. I mean, there are 674,000 cases in this country now. We know there's a lot more than that. And there's 33,000 people dead. And that number goes up appreciably every single day. That's what we do know. Everything else how we're going to come back, when we're going to come back, what it's going to look like when we come back. We don't know anything about any of that, and nor do the people who, who are trying to leave us. And that's why when they sit up there and tell you, we've done a great job and we couldn't be in a better place and now it's time to reopen. Oh, really? Where's that? Some place where there's no people. Out west where there's a bunch of mountains and a bunch of land and no people. Well, you can open there, except no one will even know you're there. Sad. And listen, we're all in this and we got to get through it. And getting annoyed or getting down about it doesn't help. But... It would be nice if we had a plan that we could rally around. I've just been waiting day after day, night after night for a plan that says we're going to do this, here's how we're going to tackle it, here's what we're going to try to achieve, and here's how we're going to do it. And nobody gives you a plan because you know why? They don't have one. They don't have one. No one has one. And they're going to basically... This federal government is going to punt it to the states and then say, the states did a great job or did a bad job. If they did a good job, they'll say, see, we did a great job with the states and did a bad job. They'll say, see, the states did a bad job. And they think that's how you can win an election. 
There's got to be more answers than that. The federal government has to be more responsible than that. We need a plan. And everybody who has a brain, whether it's a doctor or a civic leader or an economic leader or a business leader tells you, we need testing. We need testing. Otherwise, we can't tackle this. And we don't get any answers on testing. While all those academic labs and all those labs are empty, sitting there idle, which is a national disgrace. Go read that story in the Wall Street Journal today. You will shake your head. You know what? You get in a good mood by listening to the Met game tonight. Game six, Howie will take you through it. Relive it. 86 game six, one of the classic games. Classic series, classic year, 86 game six coming up. Casamigos Tequila, as always, brings you the program brought to you by those who drink it. Stay safe. Enjoy the ball game. We'll uh, see you tomorrow.